Okay, hey, welcome back to the Liverpool Black Men's Group. Um, we've been doing a podcast with um, local black men in our area of Liverpool and everything. And uh, we've been away for a while on holiday, you know, and everything like that. But we are back. And we're back with a topic that is near and dear to uh, most of us. Um, even though we are three today, we're a threesome today. But we are a threesome talking about something that's very important um and that is about mental health and so i am chase johnston lynch and everything and i am joined by yeah i'm patrick graham i'm alan crawford right and so basically black black men's mental health is something that's near and dear to all of us um we're going to kind of like just swim around the topic we realize that it's an important topic and we're going to have other podcasts on it but we just wanted to get started you know and talking about some generalizations and what i'm going to do is i'm going to start with you alan because you are actually are a counselor and, and working in mental health and everything else like that and like Tell us some of the major concerns or maybe some of the things that people don't know much about when they okay. look, talk about mental health. So for me, like my experience and my kind of angle on this is that I'm a, a counsellor working in private practice, a psychotherapist. I'm a member of the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy and also the Black African and Asian Therapy Network. And, you know, I'm passionate about therapy. I believe it works. It, it's helped me. You know, I've struggled with my own mental health in the past. And I've had several episodes of therapy myself, and it's really been important for me to do that. It's been a big part of my journey. And yet what concerns me and what, what kind of, what I notice is that not a lot of black people come for therapy. Yeah, this is indeed true. I mean, it's not one of those fallacies. It's kind of like, it's, it's like sometimes we watch it on television a lot, and we never really see, you know, representation mm -hmm. in that. And so sometimes we might think it's another person's problem, but I'm okay. Absolutely, yeah. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of stigma around mental health for men in general as well. Yeah. Like, you know, I've done quite a lot of work in the past with, you know, the, the Uncivilized Nation and Sacred Sons, who are both kind of men's groups, and they kind of work with mental health as well as men's kind of empowerment and helping men to be better men. But again, especially, you know, they tend to be quite white spaces. Yeah. And, and, you know, we chatted about this before we went on, on, on the air, but a lot of the issues that men face in general, including white men, seem even more significant in the black community. There's this bigger stigma around masculinity, around what it is to be a man, yeah. around having a front. You know, yeah, yeah and, and this this thing about you know therapies for white people therapies a white thing i think we need to break that down no exactly i mean red table talk really does that well where mm -hmm. they uh, bring it back into the importance and the consciousness of us you know um needing to be you know really it's about the communication isn't it mm -hmm. and as you probably are saying is that the, the situation is the same for all men it doesn't matter on race and everything you wanted to say something there, Patrick? Cause I yeah, no, well, no, I agree with you know them opening um, sentiments in relation to you know it is a general men problem and it increases in some level when it comes to black men because there's a lot of things that we have to take on board, um, and it's it's not necessarily even well, it's more to do with rather the the um, the causes. Of, of mental health in a, in a lot of a lot of um, black men in particular because we have that added. Um, problem of racism when within like western society especially you know what i mean from you know things which are a major to that direct and overt racism to that constant you know i've grown up all my life where literally every time i've entered a shop in the city center i've been followed yeah you know what i mean i've been followed it still happens now you know what i mean and it, it happens whether i was walking on my own or even when i was with you know, when my son was a, a, a baby, a child, you know yeah. what I mean? You're still getting followed. Or someone will, you know, you can walk in a shop where someone goes in front of you and someone will approach, walk past them and approach you and ask, can I help you? And I think, well, no, you can't. I've just yeah. come in the shop. Why would why would I, why, what is it about me that why you think I need help? You know what I mean? I've just come in the shop. And you didn't ask them in front of me who happened to be white people. You know what yeah. I mean? So all these little things adds to the problem of, of people developing mental health problems on all different levels. You know, during my life experience and my, you know, some of the work that I've done, I've worked in um, a local organisation called Mary Seco House for a number of years, which was set up. Um, specifically to, to target black mental health, you know mm. what I mean, due to, the, when I say the treatment, and then you could say the treatment and lack of treatment within the, the mental health mm. service, because on one extreme, 
um, black mental health can be ignored and not dealt with properly. Then on the other extreme, black people can be more likely to be sectioned mm. under the mental health act, be quicker to be administered um, drugs under the mental health act, and then end up, you know, on some different issues that then evolve out of that. So there's all these these, these different variables, you know what I mean? And then a lot of issues, like one, you know, there's so many different aspects of mental health, but look at that things like suicide across the board, you know, not necessarily from a black um, man's point of view, but from a men's point of view, 75% of suicides are by men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a staggering figure. And that's not just um, in the UK, that's a global figure generally, you know what I mean? And I think it was in 2018, um, according to figures, it was something like 800,000 suicides in, in, in that year. You know what I mean? And 75% of Just them are men. That's a massive sum globally. Mm. You know, across the UK, there was almost 7,000 suicides in the same year. And again, 75% of them men. You know, in, in some of my work, I, I was an immigration advisor for many years. And I, I, what I did notice is a lot of people due to their experiences, especially not just asylum seekers, but just the experiences of, of the immigration authorities and dealing with them and, and not knowing if you're going to be here tomorrow or you're going to be separated from your family. A lot of people, especially when you were dealing with black people, have become to you know, advice to seek help and, yeah. and counselling. So they've been kind of reluctant. So it is it is it is a problem, that macho thing and and then the racial stereotypes that are added to that, that black men are stronger physically yeah, than this yeah, and yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Some people attempt to live up to that. Yeah. And as you say, it is a it is a man problem in general, but it, it does Well let's 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 look at that as a topic, you know, like uh, John, you mentioned that um, um Alan about masculinity because I read an interesting book ages ago, um, can't remember the author's name, but it was like, I believe it was called Black Men Cry in the Dark. Mm-hmm. And like, um, because it's kind of like we're holding stuff in. And like when it comes down to masculinity, about being strong, about having that mm-hmm. armor or mask that we have to portray to other people, you know, it's like, what do, what do you think about um, vulnerability in there, um, Alan, because is it important for people to shed vulnerability or obviously in a safe place, Mm -hmm. but is it important for men to shed their vulnerability? Absolutely. Like, you know, linking that in with the the statistic Patrick gave around suicide, you know, I don't know if it's still accurate, but I heard a statistic as well that in the UK, the biggest killer of men under 40 is suicide. Mm. And that's a shocking statistic, it really is. And again, that's men in general. Yeah, I believe for, for black men, that is even worse for the reasons that you say, just the the stress and trauma of living while black as a black man in a society, as you say, you, you know, people are followed around in shops, people are more likely to be stopped and searched, more likely to be unemployed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of linking that in with masculinity, as you say, Chase, it's kind of... Again, in men in general, I think the reason that statistic exists is because as men, we're not good at talking about how we feel. We're mm. not. To- we have this conditioning, don't we, to don't show weakness. Yeah. And I think in black men, that that don't show weakness is even stronger. I think because of discrimination and racism, because of maybe intergenerational trauma as well, and because I think in, in I think a lot of black men feel emasculated. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good word. I mean, I mean, we're talking about you know coming from being the child of the uh, late sixties and stuff like that. You know, where you know you were made, your fathers and your grandfathers were made to appear weak, like with hanging yeah. and you know uh, the attacks and um, and all of that other kind of stuff. And they were instilled into their young sons to be strong, to keep it, keep it in, you know, to keep it together. And it's a conditioning thing. Yeah, Would just, you say just, that just, same? Just to like um, put that into context as well. Yeah. Um, when we used, like we've just used them terms here, talking about how in general men and black men are made to feel to be strong. And the reality of it is to, for, for a, any man or a black man going through any form of mental distress mm. to then go to anyone, whether it be a friend, family member or professional and speak about that, that takes great strength. There's no weakness in that in any way, shape or yeah. form. That is an actual massive strength. The weakness is 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 holding it in. That's just the easy part. To then speak about that, that's where the strength comes into Absolutely. it. And, and, and it's because we've all heard that term where, you know, 
women will use it against men. Men definitely use it against each other. Oh, man, oh, grow a pair. Yeah. All these di- different things. If, if a man wants to talk about, like, women will, if they're feeling stressed, they will just go to a friend, a family member, and they will open up and talk and say what's bothering them. Mm-hmm. Where men won't do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even in times of, you know, the obvious crisis that most people um, go through in bereavement and family members, people won't speak about that. Whereas it's not just, there's that internal thing and it, 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 it's almost like a two-way, you're caught between a, a rock and a hard place simply because from a man's point of view, it would be like, well, I can't speak out because people will see me as weak. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so yeah. straight away, it's people's perceptions that they're fearful of as mm-hmm. well. You know what I mean? So if people allowed that safe space for you to be able to have that conversation, then people would be more confident to then be able to express themselves rather than, one, they've got that internal fear themselves thinking, I know that's weak, I'm not going to say that. And then on the other hand, they say, well, I do want to speak out, but then if I do, someone's going to tell me I'm weak. No, no, but exactly. People have got to create that safe environment. People have got to gain the strength to speak out and then people have got to, again the strength to accept that speaking out because because that's a sign of weakness as well if, if, I've in the past where someone said to me are you okay and i've been i've not been going through any type of mental distress but you mm. know everyone's human you feel down you're peed up you said your job's not going well or you haven't got a job and you've been looking for for a while you've you know you've had several interviews or applications on me and for whatever reason anyway you're not feeling great and someone says are you okay so when someone asks you that to me there's a yes and a no answer Mm -hmm. i'm i'm the type of person if someone says are you are you okay and i'm feeling a bit peed i'll just say no i'm not and then i've been met with oh doom and gloom why can't you just say yeah like everyone else oh oh, wait a minute you stopped me in my tracks i wasn't expecting you to do that i said what do you mean why can't i say yes like everyone else i said you asked me a question am i okay and i'm telling you no i'm not Mm -hmm. so does that that clearly makes you feel uncomfortable now because you you know Mm -hmm. have been put in a position where you feel you you've got to respond to that so Mm -hmm. because it's it's almost like a societal norm to say when someone says you're okay you're supposed to say yeah even when you're not and that's 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 mm. what i'm saying about creating that atmosphere mm. yeah where you can say that and that's oh, no, 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 say, oh, what's wrong or they say okay well you know things will always go whatever it can be that simple response that could be enough to pick somebody up by just well, simply saying oh well it's not all bad you know give it yeah. time and things will get better rather than accusing me of being doom and gloom when you ask the question yeah. am i okay which entitled i'm entitled to say yes or no picking up on that space thing though because that's really important creating the space the atmosphere the environment where people can talk is so important but i think even to get to that point as well we have to break down some of the stigma too because you know being on the board at the caribbean one of my big emphases is, was was creating space for men and and black people you know male and female to talk about mental health to have you know whether that's therapy groups uh, therapy but one of the obstacles i've came up against is that the feedback i'm getting from people is it's a, it sounds good in principle but actually men aren't going to come to this you know well men they, gonna- they they will if given the opportunity i mean we already know that because we have a games night every mm. two weeks and everything with the liverpool black men's group i mean when given the opportunity you know, people will take that opportunity, but most people don't want to give that opportunity. I mean, I mean, it's good to know that the Caribbean, like you said, is, is offering that. Maybe that is what people should know. But like, I mean, when 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 you are like kind of like drowning mm-hmm. in a, in an in an ocean, you want that life preserver. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? You just don't know that you need that life preserver unless you're drowning, mm-hmm. right? If I'm just out here swimming. Get away from me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I mean, but I mean, I've been in several groups. I mean, I I mean, uh, I have done like some counseling training and everything like that. And I've been delivering um, support uh, work to people. And I got to tell you that they, everybody wants to be heard. Mm-hmm. They, they put a shield up that they don't want to be heard. Don't mess with me. I'm cool. Like as Patrick says, yeah, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. You know, that's always an easy answer. But it's up to the other person to ask that second question. Are you really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now you have given me the door. You knocked on my door. You opened it a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's up to me now to take advantage of that. Yeah. You know, but then you've encountered people. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't really mean it. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I, don't, I don't want you. I don't want your stuff. Forcing them to think, to maybe, to then t- not take on board pressure. Because as I said, you know, it's not like um, I was experiencing any type of bad force. No, or no. Not. Just, yeah. You know, as you do, you just feel down. You, it could be for the number of you could wake up and look out the window like a day like today. You wake up and look out the window. I thought, oh, bloody hell, look at the weather. You know what I mean? Mm. And, you know, that's enough if someone said, are you okay? Two minutes after me looking out the window, I'm going to say, no, I'm not, because I just feel it's doom and gloom, it's gloomy. And it could be that simple. Yeah. It, or, do I, or, you know, whether it be in my case or anybody's case, it could be something a lot more serious. Yeah. I remember one night I was on Facebook and someone had posted something, which was quite a scary statement. You know what I mean? About what they want to do to themselves. And, oh. and I was reading comments and there was people post them publicly in response to this person's comments and oh don't do something don't do anything stupid think of this and i thought wow i'm no expert there's no exact or perfect thing to say well i have worked in mental health i've done mental health first aid training and different things and some of that kicked in some of that memory kicked in and i thought well i'm going to respond to this person but i private messaged them exactly yeah, you don't I need to publicly i mean yeah you don't need to publicly and i said you know that. and basically all i done i didn't even ask them you know what's going on don't do that that's silly and yeah, yeah, i yeah, just yeah, got yeah. them into a conversation mm-hmm. in Very a private good. message and this conversation went on for a good part of an hour and a half mm-hmm. you know what i mean because what i remembered from the training as long as they're talking they're not harming themselves exactly yeah Very they're not good. harming themselves because yeah. in this conversation and when they stopped talking that's where I got into a bit of a panic. Mm. I thought, well, wow, what do I do now? Because yeah, because they might stop responding to, yeah. you know, what are they doing? Have they done something? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, you know, kept messaging them and not come back. And then in the end, I thought, you know what? If I wake up tomorrow and hear something's happened to this person and I didn't respond, then I'm going to feel, it's not my fault, but you, you're human, I'm going to feel no, guilty. No, I know. In the end, I phoned the police. I phoned the police and told them what's going on. And, oh, did you? you know, yeah. And they said they'd contacted the hospital and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, fortunately, the person was known to them and, and something was done. You know what I yeah. mean? So that's what you've got to do. You've got to can respond. Because it I, was can easy I, just to say, ah, maybe they've gone to bed and just shut down. Yeah. But I mean, can I, ju- can I just say that that, I mean, like, it's not like we're giving out tips or anything like that. But can I just say that that was definitely a good thing to do especially when it, when it comes to social media right you don't need to like oh i want to show that i'm a part of the caring brigade mm-hmm. you know you privately message that person which is what that person did they put out a cry for help mm-hmm. and everybody started to publicly say don't yeah. do this don't do that but it's how many people did what you did because yeah. that, that's that what it is a cry for help because if that person wanted I mean. to harm themselves so, because when someone is suicidal yeah and they're determined to do it. They don't tell anyone. They just go out and do it. Or, or they yeah. shout it just because they're going to shout it out. I shout it No, but it. when they shout it out, that's that to me, I see that from the training and experience I've had. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good sign because that is the cry for help exactly. to get that response. But when they've gone out, when they're ready yeah. to do it and they've crossed that line, yeah. then they, they do it. And yeah. people find out after they've, they've committed the act. You know what I mean? I mean. So... All that don't do anything stupid. That person could interpret that as well. You're oh, you're calling me stupid. stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, and that can just make whatever um, ill A person does or not need your judgment. Your yeah. judgment is not self saving that person. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Your judgment is you listened, you reflect, and all of that other kind of stuff, and you're there so that person can at least feel you as a tether to reality. And stuff like that. So that's good. But can I just ask, um, um, moving on a little bit from there, is that, Alan, uh, I want to ask you about the healing power of crying. Mm. Right? Because, like, in my experience and in my training, you know, um, it's not like, hey, I'm looking to break you and make you cry. But a lot of people seem to feel that they shouldn't cry, especially yeah. men. Right? So, like. Can you do you have any experience uh, about the healing power of crying? Mm-hmm. Meaning, like when someone breaks, that is a really a good opening to healing for them. Absolutely, I completely agree. I think this is one of the reasons that we as men suffer as much as we do in silence is because we don't yeah. allow ourselves to feel and to express our feelings. Yeah, and, you know, you, you mentioned the games night. Nice. And that's a great example of, of getting men in, engaging men, and definitely is positive for mental health. But I'm really interested in how do we get men into that deeper work where, as you say, mm. they're going to break down and cry. They're going to 
you know, get angry and express it in a safe space because as men and men of colour, we don't feel like it's okay for us to to cry. Or to show, or to show, or show our vulnerability, to, especially to other men, because then that must be a sign of weakness. Yeah, yeah. But even anger too, you know, the stereotype of the angry black man. You oh, well, yeah, that's uh, and, another and, topic, yes. Well, absolutely, but all these feelings are suppressed and repressed, mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, before you even look at the kind of ancestral, and uh, kind of um, intergenerational trauma that we all carry in our bodies yeah. because of what our ancestors went through and, and you know, even our parents and grandparents and stuff, and, you know, it's heavy that we carry it around. I think we do need to feel it and express it in something like therapy, but it's then how do we get black men into therapy? How do we... You know, how do we encourage men into those kind of spaces where they can cry, where they can get angry? But that's why I'm asking you in that aspect is, is like the healing power of crying because when they do what they think they shouldn't do, mm. then they get what they actually never thought they deserved, mm. right? So like in that fashion, is by actually crying over a situation because most of the time your past, Mm. It's really your enemy, right? Your past is blocking you from your present and definitely your future. Mm. So, like, by not revisiting the past because it's so painful, yeah. whatever happened to you is so painful, this is what you tell yourself or what your ego tells you. In that aspect, though, is once you break through it, it's like, it's like okay, the best example is Goodwill Hunting. Mm. Most people have seen it, right? Mm. Robin Williams and Matt Damon, where he says it's not your fault. Yeah. That was him banging on um, Matt Damon's wall, yeah. right? Chipping away at the armor that he has put up for himself <clears throat> because he lived alone. You know, he was a, a beautiful, intelligent man, but he didn't see himself as anything but like a lowly worker mm. in construction with his mates and stuff. He didn't want to move on. He was stuck, mm. right? Arrested development. But in that aspect, is when every time Robert Williams just kept banging on that wall, and he kept saying, yeah, 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 cool, cool. It's not your fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not your mm. fault. Till he actually reacted in anger by saying, don't mess with me. Mm. Right? Because now, in the past, somebody messed with him. Right? It doesn't matter what his story is. The point is, he, as everyone else, has one. Mm. But he needed to feel that somebody could hear his childhood screams. Yeah. Right? To the point where he broke down and cried. Yeah. And he changed. From there, all he needed was that hug and that understanding that somebody heard him, mm -hmm. and then he moved on with his life. Now, simplicity of a movie. I'm sure in counseling it takes a little bit more than that. But this is what I mean about the healing power of crying because we think that we have to hold it. We have to hold it because nobody cares. That's absolutely I mean, true. is that your experience in, in, in working with people in counseling? Absolutely true. I think, you know, we carry around this... You know, these wounds from childhood, we all carry them and then they come out in, you know, for me, it came out in depression, addictions, things yeah. that I've struggled with in the past, issues with food, issues with my body, you know, yeah. issues around kind of self-consciousness, not feeling free, feeling kind of, you know, walking into, into a room, feeling inferior, feeling like I don't belong, feeling, you know, feeling like I don't have a right to be there, these kind of things that yeah. come up in different parts of my life. And I've been through therapy, probably a lot of men or people feel those things but maybe we don't always say them yeah you know, i'm kind of trying to practice what i preach and express some vulnerability here with you guys to say that well it's transpersonal well, isn't it absolutely yeah. absolutely but it's, it's kind of you know you you need to work through those things with that safe loving healing relationship and, and for me even as someone who's trained as a therapist who's done quite a lot of therapy myself you know, i've been working with um, a woman a black woman uh, in therapy now uh, with me as the client for out kind of six months now um first time i've worked with a black therapist so i went into it to deal with a few different things including kind of like issues around mixed race identity and different other stuff and as usual we, we, we speak about that but then we end up in childhood and everything else but it always goes it, back it yeah. always goes yeah. back there but what i'm finding is that even for me who's done all that work i still find it hard to feel and express my feelings yeah. and this woman just being patient and just being there and caring and not judging and eventually you know starting to break down that wall that you're talking about but it's it's not easy work because yeah. just just picking up on something you said there it might have just been a slip of words but when you said you know what you're talking about your past mm. you know um issues that you've dealt with yourself and expressing vulnerability mm. that's what i picked up on and i thought well mm. no you're not expressing vulnerability you're expressing strength mm. to share that with 
you know, God knows how many mm. people are going to watch this podcast yeah. Yeah, mm. uh, o- o- over the years. That, to me, that's a massive strength to say that about your personal life. And that's that's what we're here to talk about. That's what people need to do more. Mm. Men need to do more. Black men need to yeah. do more to share that. Because that then means growth. The vulnerability side is not you necessarily expressing vulnerability for me. It's making yourself vulnerable mm. to the attacks from man looking on there mm. who might be listening and say, ah, he's weak, he's this, he's that, he, he needs to for grow sure. up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you're doing. You're making yourself vulnerable to attack, for but sure. you're not expressing vulnerability because yeah. you're expressing a great strength. Mm. But that same man or men who will say them things will all have experienced that mm want to cry but I can't because people are looking and they might think he's soft and he's this yeah. and he will continue to experience that tomorrow sure. next week next year it will never go away because we're all um, we're emotive creatures mm. uh, as human beings we all have emotions and the more you hold them in the more intense it, it will become you know what I mean and yeah. the more difficult you're making it for yourself to then eventually mm. break that that's mm. why when some people eventually do express certain things they they literally, you know, I'll use the worm, they crack, where they just fall apart and it becomes too overbearing and too powerful and they have a real mental health drop and low because it, yeah. it, 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 because the caught up between, not necessarily even their experiences, their experience could be greatly traumatising. Mm-hmm. What can be equally, or in some cases, you know, because everybody's different an individual, but what can be even more traumatising is how they feel people are perceiving them. That's where the greatest trauma well, comes from. Well, I think from. that's where Alan you know said mean? about... Rather than the actual experience they sure. went through. For That'll sure. be part of it. It could be 40%, 49%, yeah. or mm-hmm. 51%, or 60%, or even more in some cases could be how people are going to look at me, or the men especially. Absolutely. Me mates, me this, me that, me... Even women, you know, they might say, ah, he's a weak man, I don't want a weak man. Because well, well, yeah, but this is what so Alan said about a safe search. you've got to take on board, and yeah. that's... We need to break them down as individuals, mm-hmm. but as a society. Because yeah. for me or you or anyone to be able to express that, like today for you to say what you said, okay, you're not facing people personally full on, but you're facing us too and you feel, we've made you feel and you've got that feeling where I'm com- comfortable, I can say this in front of them too. Yeah, yeah. Because we're speaking to a blind public. Mm, you know, yeah. if there was a group of people in a room, <laughs> that might be different and you might not mm. say that, you know, that's where the strength lies in expressing it. And part of that strength is today talking about it because that will trigger things and it will make people yeah, yeah, think, yeah. you know, as a writer, my motto is I write for fun, but it ain't no joke because what I write is to make the four provoke. And these discussions, all of these podcasts, not just ours, but yeah, in yeah, general, yeah. are to provoke mm. thought, discussion, which will then lead to discussion, which then leads to action yeah. and, and can only be beneficial to that individual and wider society. Yeah, but that's what I'm trying to say. It's like when he said about a safe circle or a counselor, but then the thing about it is it's about expanding that circle. And, you know, as as, as to the art of that expansion, you know, like, um, you know, we also ask for people to please like and subscribe on, on these podcasts uh, uh, as they air on, on YouTube. And, yeah, it is being public and it is being vulnerable and open, but also, too, is you have the ability to share as well and you can share and comment below um, just as you feel the need to. And but what I'm just trying to stress though is is that these secrets are not to be held on to, mm-hmm. right? Because a lot of times the things that happen to us in our youth and in our past are not our fault, which is what I use that goodwill hunting for. So, but we 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 have magical thinking as children mm-hmm. is that it is our fault. So we've caused it. So whatever pain we've caused, whatever guilt and shame we've added, usually doesn't belong to us. And that's usually what the uh, case is when you actually go through these kind of journeys of communication. And that's why I was talking about the healing power of crying, because the idea is you've held on to this and it feels like a nugget, like a rock in your stomach. Right. And in that aspect, Mm -hmm. it causes you to act in a particular way. It causes you to armor up. But then the free and power of it, though, is, is that when it's released, it's released. And I can't tell you about the feeling. I don't want to use the word heavenly feeling, but I can't tell you about the freeing feeling that you have when you've actually revealed something that for you was a basement secret. Yeah. You know, it's like climbing out of the basement. And sometimes people go back down because they, they're comfortable. They're safe. 
But the idea is to come up into the light of the apartment, you know. So that's what it is about when we talk about mental health. I mean, like, I mean, we're not talking about the autistic spectrum here today. We're talking about mental health, and we're not talking about ill health as like um, um, ill mental health where people have like uh, um, um, severe um, needs. We're talking about mental health, like taking care of yourself, and in that aspect is. Just, only the beginning of this mm. conversation, you know, um, as to why it's important. And I'm hopefully that people can feel that at least we as only three mm. having a conversation, you know, that's why I'm adding people to the board to open up to it. And, and, and long as they don't think that I have to keep that door closed anymore, you know, there's, there's a choice that I'm making now today mm. as a grown person to actually reveal myself and what into you that factor. What you say is really important. Like, you know, but there is a conversation to be had about severe and enjoying mental health, but it's not the conversation we're having here. The conversation we're having here is about the kind of mental health that we all have. Right. We all have mental health. And what you said is, is absolutely true. Those it's things, not just a black and white mental no, health. No, no, no. It's, 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 exactly. And, and we all carry this this kind of guilt, shame, whatever it is, but it festers in the dark, but it can't survive go. in the light of awareness. I, it can't survive in the light exactly. of, of, of empathy and acceptance, yeah. Can I just interject on that a bit quickly, just to add this point as well? I, I, I was a family support worker for a number of years, and what, what I noticed when I was working with males, the younger they were, the more they would speak. Mm. So it's definitely a societal thing that you, you, it's social um, engineering that, sure. that you, 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 that develops over time. So mm-hmm. if I was talking to a nine-year-old who's going through whatever difficulties at home and in school and we were trying to, you know, explore them and talk, they were more open. But when I talked to a 14, 15-year-old, mm. it's a whole different ball mm. game and trying to break down. And what was difficult in that job was you only had a limited amount of time. Yeah. Know, Mm-hmm. to work with them you know you might be seeing them once a week twice a week if you were fortunate mm-hmm. for a six week period which mm-hmm. is very it's not it's nowhere near enough time because it might take you five weeks mm-hmm. just to get them to eventually open up where sure. you, you haven't even touched on any of the issues that mm-hmm. are bothering them you've just had to win their confidence exactly. to, 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 to let them know that I am someone I can, you can talk to yeah. you know what I mean and I found when I was dealing with an eight or nine year old within by the second session they were ready to talk, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But when I was dealing with a 14, 15-year-old, it, w- it could be very trying on you to, to get them to open up because it would just be, well, I'm not talking right. to you people. What, even she, go as far as saying, you, yeah. you, you, what, you, you're saying I'm crazy? I said, well, I've never used them words. Yeah. They're your words, you know what I mean? No one said that, but, well, who said that to you? And you say, no one. So you, yeah. said- and you know clearly someone has the yeah. friends, whatever yeah. you know the peer group will look at them in that way and again it's back down to that perception mm-hmm. whatever their issue is the bigger issue is how people will see me mm-hmm. or or there's an equal issue right. it, that you've got to get over both of them boundaries yeah I'm not saying that you know no one get me wrong i'm not saying it's always the perceptions that mm-hmm. create the bigger issue but in a lot of cases that can become the bigger problem rather than the actual problem do you know what you said then about it taking five or six weeks maybe just to even build trust and just to kind of break down those barriers to even begin the conversation. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the reasons as well that, that people in general, I think especially men and especially, especially black men, are let down by the mental health system in this country. Mm. Because, you know, if you can't afford to pay privately, as a lot of people can't, if you go to your doctor for, for mental health in this country, you'll get offered medication. Yeah, pills. If you're yeah. lucky, you get put on a list for counselling. Mm-hmm. But the only counsel on offer is CBT, which you know has its as its its pros, but it, it's it's not depth therapy that goes to the root of things, and you have to wait for that sometimes six months or more, and when you get it, you get six sessions. Yeah. And, and I, as a therapist, yeah, I know over. that it takes more than six sessions, even what you just said, just to build trust, mm. and especially for 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 black men. To, to trust a professional, possibly a white professional, sat across the desk who, who maybe doesn't get what it's like to be you, what can you do in six sessions? Yeah, no, and then you're, spe- you're explaining who, who, who you are and all that to that person. Let me just move on to uh, um, another topic, you know, uh, in understanding in case of time. Is is that, like, what we face as black men is, is that this whole um, weight of the white person that is encountering us. 
right? Which is why, you know, mental health seems to be, like, an issue. It's like, you know, like, uh, you know, walking down the street and the white person's, you know, crossing the street um, and everything. But then you also have, like, uh, people who are like, oh, I, I, I want to help. I want to I wanna understand, right? And it's like, I don't understand. I went to school. You went to school. I don't know why you don't know stuff I know. But either way is, what do you deal with? Um, how do we help support people who, who who may not be of our race in that aspect, you know, in that aspect to understand why we have a big weight that we're carrying as black men. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, do you choose like to just like, uh, you, I'll leave you to your own devices or can we actually reach out across the table and try and help as well in their understanding? Where would you begin? Well, there's, there's so many different places to begin, but looking at it in one aspect, from time a person assumes that because you're black, mm. your mental health and and the treatments or the way you would need to be spoken to is going to be somehow different. Like, why, why, of, why are you yeah, acting like that? Your, your experiences you will that? be different because you are black due to racism and so mm -hmm. on. But yeah. the implications of mental health on whether you're you know black, white, or whatever are the same, you know what I mean? From a black person's point of view, you know, um, that racism might be an element of it. But then when someone assumes simply because you're black as if to say, well, there's a whole different approach needed, well, that's part of the problem. Because well, it's all, it's straight away it's saying, well, because you're black, you're different for all these different reasons. And whereas if it was a white person, I only need to give you one tablet, because you're black, you need three. You know, because that's basically, that's to just put it simple. You know, you know I'm not what I mean? a psychologist. Like, why, why do you got to make it, an issue around it? Why has it got to be a black thing? That's what I'm talking yeah. about. When they would say, when they would respond like that, why has it got to be a black thing? Why well, you got to make it that's what I'm saying. That's part of the problem. Because I know, that's what I'm asking. Because they're saying. not recognising mm -hmm. due to, you know, there'll be a number of factors. Exactly. You know, they're not recognising due to they're not able to, mm -hmm. or they're not recognising, which is the more... Um, prevalent but i would think is simply because to recognize it will be them fingers pointing back at yourself mm -hmm. yeah and it'll be showing it'll be people people have got pride yeah mm -hmm. and all pride is foolish so a lot of people do not like to admit the wrong yeah yeah where we're taught as youngsters you grow and you learn from your mistakes, and that's everybody. You grow and you learn. You, you're doing a math sum uh, as a four-year-old or five-year-old in school. You get it wrong, and your teacher shows you how you got it wrong, then shows you how to get it right. So you learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. So if you couldn't accept you got it wrong from that age, you would never learn how to get it right. And that's the same thing with, with people. So it's easy for them to say, oh, you're just making it a black issue, rather than recognise that them are part of that problem. It, that's why it becomes a black issue. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're not you stereotyping me. You, mm. You're putting me into boxes. You, you're this. You do. Yeah. You're doing all these different things. You know. I was on a webinar recently where someone asked a question: When you come into work, should you leave your blackness at home? And I'm thinking, <laughs> what does that even mean? What do you mean by leave your blackness? Yeah, what does Peel that mean? Off? Peel yeah. it off. Because that's the silly interpretation I got in my head. Because you've got to. You've got to come with it at a certain level of humour, you know what I mean? When yeah, you're think about, I, I wow. laugh at that one. They didn't ask me that question, but I thought, wow, that's a heavy thing, because what does that mean, leave your blackness at home? You are who you are, yeah? Your blackness is a colour, part of it's your culture. That's like saying to someone who's, whether they be Irish or from China or this yeah, or this, yeah, yeah. do you leave that at home? You know, so, but you would never ask them that, but you would... Just going back to what you're saying, you would only ask the black person that. Yeah. Do you leave your black? And you say, well, what does that, what do you mean by leave your, I'm an individual and how I act and my character, that is me. That's the key. It doesn't define it? whether I'm black or this or that. It just defines me as that yeah. person. Part of my blackness, there might be aspects of my blackness. It could be certain things, the way I dress or the way my hair is, but that's, that's not something I could leave at home even if I wanted to. Yeah. Because, that's who I am as a, as a person. But leave your opinion yeah, at home. I can't leave yeah. my skin colour at home yeah. mm -hmm. because ultimately, to me, that's almost what it means, yeah. you know, to ask that question. Right. You mentioned you know, being seen as an individual. I think that's part of the thing, isn't it? It's, it's a hard balance to... Because on one hand, you do have to recognise who a person is, and that includes the, you know, the race, their culture, their heritage, their age, their class, everything does have a bearing in who they are. But absolutely, as you say, at the same time, we can't then make assumptions or stereotypes based on those things. So it's kind of, 
taking that person-centered approach of you are an individual so you tell me what it like to be you because your experience of, of, of blackness might be different to Chase's. Well, yeah. Everybody, leaves, to something. Chase everybody, everybody leaves something at home when they go yeah. into work because you, you've only got to be sitting in work or, or sitting next to anyone and in, especially in work, having a conversation, then the phone goes mm. and black, white, Chinese, Asian, whatever. As soon as you pick that phone up, you leave something behind. Mm. You leave and you become that more a little bit more professional. So it's not about, it's not a cultural thing. Mm. It's a professional thing. So everybody leaves something behind when they do that because mm. we all do. We'll pick up the phone and suddenly you've got this phone voice which you didn't have 10 seconds, 5 mm. seconds earlier when you were yeah, yeah, talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. In a professional manner with <laughs> other people, but as soon as you pick the phone up, oh, yes, I know. Yo, and homie, what's going on, on, man? <laughs> you don't pick up the phone like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's something that I've heard Lawrence say links into this about we need to challenge rigid ideas of what blackness is. Mm-hmm. I think it plays mm-hmm. into our discussion here around mental health because I think well, some man. of those defences around masculinity and all that, sometimes they play into a stereotypical rigid idea of well to be black you have to be like this yeah yeah to be yeah, black yeah. you can't talk about your feelings you can't yeah, kind of be this way this, that way that way you know that, yeah, yeah yeah you yeah. can't you know you, you've got to eat certain food you've got to listen to certain music you, mm. you know all these different things yeah and that's part of a culture mm. and, and this and that which always evolves and changes but again it is it's a deep deep issue but to get to the bottom of it it's got to be a two way thing because for me to have the strength to speak out, yeah, then I've got to be confident that the person I'm speaking out to, yeah, and that listening. applies to me or anyone, it's not just listening, mm. but will afford me the, the empathy to, to hear me problem and not just oh, look yeah, at it. Yeah. Ah, you're just being weak, I don't want to know, you know what? Don't even bother me with that. Tell somebody else that's just all oh, that's foolishness, that's weakness, that's this, that's that. Because there will be people who will look on this podcast mm. and will have the opinion, yeah, what are they talking about? What kind of nonsense? What do you mean about black man crying and this and that? That's, that's just weak, that's weak man, you know, yeah, weak yeah, man. Yeah. You know, I don't think so. Man's <laughs> supposed to do this, man's supposed yeah. to do that, yeah, yeah. and man's so, and these are societal things. I was at a, um, a workshop a few months ago, two months back, where the the, the young children had to guess the. Um, this is what I'm talking about: social conditioning, social engineering. Yeah. They had to guess the employment of each person, mm. and when it, when they was asked who's the mechanical engineer, boys and girls, and these are eight and nine year olds, by the way. Mm. You know what I mean? They all pick the main. And when they were told, no, 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 no one then f- decided, well, I'll choose one of the women. They just stayed silent. Mm-hmm. So even though it, logic would dictate, well, if it's none of the men and you've gone through them all, it must be one of the women. Mm-hmm. But th- already at such a tender age, they've been socially engineered that it can't possibly be a woman. You know what I mean? And that's all part of, you know, it's not a mental health issue, but it's all part of conditioning and that acceptance. Yeah. If I'm strong enough to speak, You've got to be strong enough to listen. Yeah. If you're not strong enough to listen, you're going to stop me by speaking, by saying, oh, no, grow up here, man mm. up, do all, all these different, man, don't cry. Well, why do you have to say you're not okay? Just say, you know, you know mm. like everyone else, say, yeah, I'm all right. And I think, well, because it's mm. clearly made you feel uncomfortable. Absolutely. When, you're self, when you analyze that scenario, people don't want to hear that you're not okay. But as the saying goes, which we hear a lot recently, is it is okay to be not okay absolutely you know what I, mean? yeah. I think so, what you yeah. said then is really important about kind of you know people watching this kind of making judgments or thinking you know what we're doing chatting about crying and stuff like that but i, I think sometimes even in the conscious black community sometimes you know we focus on being conscious of history being conscious of politics being conscious of racial dynamics but even sometimes in the conscious community how conscious are we about mental health it's one thing we want to champion and change yeah and i think you know one of my hopes is that both at the Caribbean Centre and within Liverpool Black Men's Group is that that's one of the things we can champion because yeah. I, I think conscious black, um, the conscious black movement has to include being conscious of mental health. Yeah. And part of that, and what I'm seeing positive things on the internet around is, you know, um, African-centred healing circles becoming a bigger thing, yeah. you know, and, and that becoming part of what we're, what we're doing, I think. Yeah. And, well, and myself, just to, just to finish off, the last point I want to make, I look at myself as fortunate in some ways. And what, what I mean by that is from an early age, from 18, 19, I was an immigration advisor, yeah, for over 10, 12, 14 years. And in that particular post, I come across a lot of people, black, white, all different nationalities, facing trauma 
and mental health issues mm. and that allowed me the strength to be emphatic with them you know yeah. what I mean and don't get me wrong I'm not saying if I was feeling down and this and that I'm the type of person who just goes out and blabs off my mouth I do talk I do express my feelings but I'm also guilty of holding back mm -hmm. and you know we all are because yeah. we're only human you know on the grounds of what someone might think or you will say it to one person but you wouldn't say it to the other because you know they're too mm -hmm. judgmental and they haven't got the time for that where this person's more listening and, and what not and what not but because of that earlier experience in my younger years you know I mean that allowed me to be more um um receptible yeah. to someone to to be able to come to me and say well you know what i'm feeling this and that and i can then respond to that you know what i mean and, and, and or i am someone who you could approach like that if you didn't know and yeah say, you know what i'm feeling down about this and i'd say well look you know blah 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 now i'm not going to tell anyone before because that's the first fear what i've heard people express don't tell anyone that i come here or that i have this or that said, well oh, they no, would know because you're on youtube so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no i'm not but but that's the fear because again i've got to keep emphasizing that yeah. because that is what's holding a lot of people yeah. back from expressing yeah. themselves so the yeah. fear of how they will be perceived yeah. Yeah. you know what i mean more which can affect them equally and in a lot of cases more than the actual thing that's traumatizing them or bothering yeah. them the fear of perception because perception's are powerful and yeah. they can, you know they can cost people's it costs people's their lives because they're scared to come out and open and express themselves they convince themselves the only way out of it is to go and take their own life yeah. and that's why suicide in men is so high 75 percent plus yeah. it's so high because they think you know that's the easy way out for them because it's too hard to go and speak to somebody so yeah. they do that and you know and that obviously leaves a lot of heartache behind uh, 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 of the people but you know they're not thinking of that Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. If they thought it's going to upset my friends, my mum, my dad, my parents, and all these people, they wouldn't do it. But the fact they've, they've, you know, they've put themselves in that corner where they feel they can't go to anybody because they'll say this or they'll think that. And, you know, so they're in that two-way battle of what they're thinking about themselves, that I'm no good, I'm not this. But then if I tell someone, that's only going to confirm me because they're going to say I'm no good because... I've tried that in the past or I've seen someone else do it or I've done it to somebody myself yeah. 10 years ago before I've even got to it. I remember doing it to someone myself who they've expressed, you know, um, made themselves vulnerable by showing strength and expressing the feelings as a man and you've dissed them. Yeah. You know I mean, so that I go where you, you're this, you're that. I'm not going to use them words on there, but you're P, you're this, you're that, or yeah. you're weak and whatever. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, well, it brings us like down to the end of this um, part of the uh, conversation um, and everything. I just want to thank the honesty of my brothers here, um, you know, um, Patrick Graham and uh, Alan Crawford, and even the honesty of myself, Chase Johnson Lynch. This has been a Liverpool Black Men's Podcast. This has only been the first conversation on mental health. Uh, we'll be hopefully joined next time by several other brothers who also have their opinions and about to express themselves. These are our opinions. These are our experiences. But we also hope that um, people out there can feel the importance of hearing the conversation by black men like ourselves about such a, um, a personal topic, masculinity versus vulnerability. We're not talking about how crying is a, is, is, a, is a thing. We're talking about crying is healing. We're talking about breaking through, you know, and to like uh, and showing support of others and everything. And um, but I, I definitely enjoyed this conversation. I hope you, know, you guys enjoy the conversation as well and everything. And then look forward to the next part two conversation on mental health um, by the Liverpool Black Men's Group. And uh, thank you guys for joining me today. Yeah, it's been great. It's a great discussion, so thank you.